I'm Baxter Eaves, and you're in the room for the Explainable AI talk. So uh, a little bit about me uh, to give you some perspective on where my perspective comes from. My background is actually in psychology, in cognitive science more specifically. So I did a lot of using statistical models for models of human learning. I did a lot of research in social learning and computational trust. I moved on after grad school to more ML AI specific roles in uh, probabilistic programming, uh, machine teaching, and for a while I worked in industry as a data scientist, uh, <laughs> uh, doing mostly agriculture, uh, and now I'm doing research in something we're calling humanistic AI, which is psychologically validated AI that's shown to mimic, predict, and improve human performance. And uh, if anybody plays TF2, I'm a medic main, because somebody has to not be a spy or a sniper. <laughs> Thank you. And this is a high level talk about safe AI. And safe AI is something that's really important to me. Uh, I'm guilty of this and I think other people are too, but I get so caught up in the adventure of solving really cool complex problems that I lose sight of whether the way I'm solving them is appropriate for the domain that I'm solving the problem for. And so we're gonna be talking about explainable AI as one potential path to getting towards safe AI. So I wanna talk about some of the problems with mainstream AI and how we got them. And when I say mainstream AI, I'm talking about the post 2011 AI uh, that's appearing in the popular press, that's doing the big tasks at the big companies. So mainly deep learning and its derivatives and the other uh, similar type black box models. So to begin, AI has really become ubiquitous in our personal lives, thanks to the rise of internet business and social media and the availability of cheap computing through the cloud. AI is no longer just running behind the scenes on mainframes at banks anymore, it's everywhere all the time. It's doing stuff like sending us targeted ads, it's uh, recommending us products to buy and entertainment to consume, it's doing image classification to find adult content or copyright violations or put dog ears on us on Instagram. Uh, in, in the past few years, we've even beat the best human players at Go and StarCraft and Dota. And if we look at these tasks that AI has really been kicking butt in, uh, it has some common features or constraints. One, there are big data tasks. So data are nearly free and unlimited. If you're doing ad targeting by tweets, you have more data than you can ever possibly handle. Uh, action takes priority over learning. You'd rather send somebody an irrelevant ad than no ad. You'd rather recommend them an uninteresting video than no video. And the reason is that there's little to no cost of failure. In fact, doing the wrong thing is often better than doing nothing at all. So if we're uh, sending ads and we give somebody a relevant, an irrelevant ad, we miss out on a couple of cents for a click. Uh, if we give somebody an uninteresting video, they can click they're not interested and tell us why so we can actually improve the algorithm. In that case, we actually win by doing the wrong thing. And uh, since these are the constraints that AI really grew up to tackle, uh, we now have AI that is inefficient, that requires, kind of expects a lot of data to work, that is opaque, that hides its knowledge away, is difficult to understand, is difficult to use and maintain and is brittle that can fail unexpectedly and catastrophically and that is easy to attack. And this isn't a problem until we start using it for things that matter on a societal scale. So the things that keep us fed and safe and well. So things like biotech, public health, agriculture, defense and intelligence. In these sectors, we have the opposite constraints of the mainstream AI tasks. Now data are scarce and expensive. It's incredibly expensive to run a clinical trial. Your data points are costing thousands or tens of thousands of dollars and take months or longer to generate. Action is dependent on learning. So if we're building a science-based product, we need to create a knowledge base to build that product on. If we wanna improve that product, we have to improve that knowledge. And there's an iterative scientific process that goes along with that. Or maybe we need to recognize all the risks associated with taking a certain action so we can mitigate those risks. Because now, failure potentially costs lives. Obviously, if we're doing something like uh, designing treatment plans for cancer patients, we wanna make sure that what we're doing is definitely, hopefully gonna make things better, but definitely not make things worse. 
And what we're seeing, though, is that AI meant for these benign tasks is starting to be adapted for high-risk tasks. And there have been some bumps. So Uber and NVIDIA, their self-driving car, killed a pedestrian. They had to stop uh, their trial for a while to diagnose the problem. And it's really difficult because these systems are difficult to diagnose because they're opaque. So they came back after a while and they said, two, well, two things happened. One, the uh, system chose not to swerve because, they, uh, because it marked the lady on the bike as a false positive. That's from my understanding from the reading. Uh, and the other thing was that the safety driver trusted the system implicitly and they weren't paying attention, they were on their phone. IBM kind of riding, uh, wait, riding the wave of success of their Jeopardy playing robot. I guess they decided that Jeopardy wasn't the most scalable business model. They decided to branch out into other sectors, which I think was a, a smart move. And healthcare, obviously, a big sector. And to us, as lay people, it might seem like kind of low-hanging fruit. Medical diagnosis and treatment seems like flow charts. You look up stuff in a book, and it's really formulaic. Uh, so they trained these algorithms up and they started to sell them and have trials. And what they found was that in some cases, the agreement between doctors and the algorithm was uh, as low as 33%. And even worse, in some cases, it would recommend things that were potentially fatal, like giving drugs that could cause hemorrhaging to patients who already had problems with bleeding. And I don't think that anybody actually did get hurt as a result of this. But if you read this report that Stat News did, there's some very colorful language by a bunch of very angry and maybe uh, exasperated doctors that were a part of these trials. So how do we make safe, uh, AI safe when safety matters? Because it doesn't matter all the time. It doesn't matter when we're doing ads or video recommendations. But sometimes when it matters, it really, really matters. One potential way is explainable AI. So there's this program through DARPA called XAI. And uh, kind of the motivation behind this is that DARPA has probably spent more money on AI research than anybody else. And what they found in the past couple of years is that the AI they've spent so much money on is not something they can use in a lot of cases. In defense and the military, when you make a decision, that's an order. You put your name to a piece of paper and you are legally responsible for the outcomes of that decision. Uh, imagine if that was the case for self-driving cars, if the lead engineer could go to jail if the self-driving car caused any damage. Uh, also, in the military, of course, the lives of, very, uh, of a lot of people and the fates of nations are kind of on the line, and you don't want to potentially start a war at the whim of what is to you effectively a magic eight ball. So there are some questions that we want to be able to ask these systems to make ourselves feel better to, uh, as DARPA put it, appropriately trust the system. And that's a concept we're going to come back to a whole bunch. So we want to know, why did you do that? Why didn't you do something else? When do you succeed? When do you fail? When can I trust you? How do I correct an error? And so the way that they envision this now is today we have these learning processes that create these functions that just somehow relate inputs to outputs. They're impenetrable. They're hard to understand when you look at them. And then they give you an answer. This is a cat, p equals 0.93. And uh, you're at your laptop with lightning bolts coming out of your head because you're super frazzled. What we want is we want all new learning processes that create interpretable, explainable models that the user will interact with through an explainable interface. We want to say, this is a cat because it has fur and whiskers and claws. Of course, that would also explain a dog. So you get the extra information uh, about the parts of the image, maybe, that help to explain that. So explainable AI has been around long before the uh, buzzword. This is a nomogram or a nomograph. It is a figure that perfectly explains a simple model. And this was invented uh, in the late 1800s. So we have our model there at the bottom. We have our inputs, S and R. So these are the things that we observe, the data that we get. And we have our output, T, which is the thing that we want to predict. We find our value of S for our input on the S scale there. We find our value of R on the R scale for whatever input. We cross those two points uh, with a line. And where they intersect on the T scale, that's our output. 
So we've been able to perfectly explain the knowledge of this simple equation for all sets of possible inputs. Uh, but of course, something like this doesn't scale to the thousands or tens of thousands or even more inputs that we uh, get when we're doing something like image processing or something like that or genomics. Uh, expert systems, these were really popular in uh, starting in the 80s. They're software hardware systems where you basically encode expert knowledge onto a system to solve domain specific problems. And uh, you get a, st a lot of stuff that looks like flow charts with a lot of if else statements. Uh, you can give it some data and it can use certain heuristics to solve problems. Uh, the problem with these was that they're really expensive. It's super expensive to uh, develop these because you have to sit down with people and encode all of their knowledge and that takes a lot of human capital to do. The hardware was really expensive to buy and to maintain. And after a certain level of expense, uh, because this is a problem that there are humans ready to solve, you might as well just hire someone at a certain point. And of course today, uh, there are things that we want to do where there are no human experts or it's very difficult to encode that knowledge or proceduralize it. So we want to learn to create experts from data. So explainable AI, uh, I guess basically post 2011, post 2012. Most of the AI focus has been on deep learning and within deep learning, the flagship task is um, image classification. So most of the work has focused on image classification. So we're seeing a lot of stuff like this. This is a highly cited paper that uh, proposes ways to kind of help people to understand convolutional neural networks. It uh, shows you how to go layer by layer and kind of pull out the feature maps and see what parts of the feature maps are really important. But I think the most relevant part of this is this bit here. So the image in the middle is a heat map where each pixel represents the probability of classifying this image over here correctly, given that this gray square is on that pixel. So uh, let's take this blue pixel here in the middle. We put the gray square there, and we see the probability of correctly classifying that as a Pomeranian is basically zero because we've removed, presumably, all the important information there. We can see what the alternative classifications are over here. So if we put the gray square over here and leave the uh, ball there visible, it's going to classify it as a tennis ball. Uh, maybe if we move it to a different area, we classify it as a different kind of dog, and so on. Uh, this is a saliency map. So this kind of does back propagation to compute a gradient uh, with respect to classifying uh, correctly. And it gives us the important parts of the image to classifying correctly uh, in kind of this way. And you can see that it's pulled the dog parts out of the dog image and left the sand part behind. Uh, and Sometimes there's lots going on in an image and we want to pull out the different pieces. So there are potentially lots of ways to classify this. You wouldn't expect a machine to classify this as a dog man playing an acoustic guitar. But you might expect uh, part of it to be electric guitar. So the frets there and then the body of the guitar explains acoustic guitar. And then the Labrador head explains Labrador. And uh, part of the shirt here with I think it's foot uh, helps to explain that. And there are other approaches using heat maps like this uh, with different interpretations that are computed uh, with different levels of complexity and speed. Uh, we can do similar things with text too. So recurrent neural networks are big in the NLP literature. So if we know the type of thing that we want to predict, say we want to predict when we're going to see a quote or uh, when we're going to see a comment in code or we want to predict the depth of an expression, we can do that. Uh, I think in this paper they use cross entropy to do that. Uh, and this is a slide directly stolen from the XAI program updates. Of course, it's approved. See on the bottom, I can steal it. It's OK. Uh, but a lot of the teams, uh, there are, I think, four slides, four or five slides in this deck that were dedicated to what the individual teams were doing. And a lot of them were doing uh, helping to explain deep networks. So they grouped them all together and kind of pulled out some of the more salient examples. So a, a lot of what people are doing as in this project is creating text explanations. So we see over here, uh, 
This has a text caption for an image, so it's a man in a jacket standing at a slot machine, and it shows you which parts of the image were important for generating that part of the caption. Uh, this one down here, it combines two types of neural networks, uh, convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks to learn how to actually make these sorts of captions. And XAI work is mostly focusing on explanation because explanation is right in the, the name there. Uh, but there are some problems with explanation. Uh, one, uh, explanation is being mostly built for computer scientists by computer scientists. And this has been likened to letting inmates run the asylum. So it's, we're asking the people who kind of got us into this situation to get us out. And this paper by Tim Miller and Piers Howe and Liz Sonnenberg, who are kind of a mixture of both computer scientists and psychologists, to paraphrase, it's bad software comes from not thinking of the user. Explainable AI researchers are ignoring lots of social science research on explanation, and instead they're relying around their intuitions and their needs to design these systems, and they ought to stop doing that. So Tim Miller kind of wrote a follow-up uh, that is a really long, nice review of the explanation literature for XAI researchers. And he's saying that there are two components here. There's the AI side, and then there's the human decision maker that's interacting with the AI. So this research really needs to combine three things. It needs to combine artificial intelligence, social science, and human computer interaction literatures because people respond and learn differently than machines, especially when interacting with humans or things that anthropomorphize. And that's not a quote, that's just my addition there. Uh, and to kind of make that clear, so uh, back in the 90s, a Watson, or it wasn't Watson, it was Deep Blue then, it was a different IBM computer playing a different game. Uh, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov in chess, and this is when we decided that we finally conquered chess. And uh, Deep Blue made a really perplexing move, and Kasparov described it. He said, it was a wonderful and extremely human move. I had played a lot of computers, but I had never experienced anything like this. I could feel, I could smell a new kind of intelligence across the table. And it turns out it was a mistake, it was a glitch. It just <laughs> did this random thing, and he attributed this higher plane of reasoning, this intention to this machine, and it cost him the game. And after reading this, I started playing my wife like this, and uh, she won't play with me anymore. <laughs> Watson uh, almost snuck a wrong response by Jeopardy, uh, by Trebek. So it's important to note that Watson was not aware of what the other contestants said. So uh, there was an example of him repeating Ken Jennings' answer and they having a, them having like a special orange light to express embarrassment at doing that. Uh, but in this case, the question was something to do with um, this odd feature of Olympian, uh, Olympic gymnast so-and-so from the like, 1920s uh, Olympics. And the answer was, what is missing a leg? The guy was missing a leg. And Ken Jennings said, what is missing a hand? And Trebek said, that's wrong. And Watson said, what is a leg? And Trebek said, you know, that's right, but it's actually not right because he said a leg, not missing a leg. Of course, having a leg is not an odd feature. Uh, so Trebek attributed this extra humanity to this machine because tons of language is context, maybe most of language. So if you're sitting in an office with your buddy, uh, watching all the, the monitors, making sure the systems don't go down, and you say, hey, are you gonna be around in the next five minutes? He just says, yeah, go take a break. He didn't ask to take a break, but he knows from the context. So this is one of those weird things that people do uh, that make them more efficient. Problem two, explanation doesn't actually solve the problem. So because explanations don't prevent problems, they tell you, they offer excuses as to why they happened. So saying that you labeled someone as a false positive really doesn't help anybody. It might help things in the future, but we like to get to things before they happen. It also doesn't help to answer a lot of these questions that are called out in this program. So it will help you answer why you did that and why not something else, but it doesn't really help you get to when do you succeed, when do you fail, when can I trust you, how do I correct an error? Uh, problem three, explanation is not really knowledge. So 
an explanation tells you a little bit about why an action or a prediction happened, but there is so much knowledge inside of that machine that created that prediction or uh, action. So uh, they're using neural nets for particle accelerator experiments, and we would like to know what is inside the machine without having to ask it why it thought uh, a certain collision was classified a certain way. Uh, we'd like to use interpretable models to do that. An interpretable model is trivially explainable, like a linear regression. Here we can say if we had to guess someone's height by their weight, we would assume someone is taller if they weigh more. The problem, of course, is making models that are interpretable in general is really hard, making them powerful and performant even more so. Uh, so there's a lot of work uh, going on here, and it's kind of a slog, but people are working at it. Uh, explanation makes inappropriate trust worse. We saw a couple of examples how we tend to anthropomorphize things and that can cause problems, that can cause us to overtrust. Uh, but people are biased to trust because more trust means faster learning. If I trust no one, if I go around in the world thinking everyone is a liar and no one will tell me the correct answer to anything, I can't learn from anyone. I can't read a book, I can't ask my family, I can't rely on my teachers. I have to go out like the first human being and build a civilization from scratch, trial and error, everything. And that's no way to learn. If I trust everyone implicitly, then I can accept everything everyone says without question. And so I can accept a lot of information quickly, I can learn a lot quickly, I can stand on the so shoulders of giants and I don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, of course, we want somewhere in the middle, but there is a reason to bias towards trust. The problem is that these deep networks are brittle and unpredictable, and we really ought not be trusting them in a lot of cases. So if you just Google attack deep learning, you're gonna get hundreds of results. And this is an example of real world attacks on image classifiers like you might see in a self-driving car. So what is this? Nope, it's a speed limit 45 sign. <laughs> what is this? Also a speed limit 45 sign. So having a heat map overlaid on these smudges telling you that this was important to, to labeling as a speed limit 45 sign doesn't really help you all that much. Uh, and this is not something that we're easily fooled by as human beings. If that wasn't brittle enough for you, we can change single pixels and images and change the outcome of a classifier. And uh, this is kind of an attack using that saliency map that I showed you a while back. We can compute a Jacobian on that saliency map and uh, attack that network. And so we can make, a, uh, make the system think that a deer is an airplane, reverse cats and dogs, uh, think horses are dogs, and birds are frogs, and all sorts of weird stuff by just changing one pixel, which might look like a compression artifact. If you are outputting a heat map it might of an explanation, that might also look like a compression artifact. So this is a very scary attack. So how do we fix these problems? Uh, I don't know how to fix all of the problems, but I think we can fix a lot of them if we just go ahead and embed machine knowledge into the human mind. We just take that knowledge, we do a Johnny Mnemonic or a Matrix or some other Keanu Reeves thing, and we get that knowledge <laughs> inside of that person. And if we could do that, a lot of these questions change. They're no, we're no longer relying on the machine to answer them, we're introspecting. We ask, why did I do that? Why didn't I do something else? When do I succeed? When do I fail? When can I trust myself? And if we get into a situation where we feel icky, we can step back and think about it like we do. And that's all good and well to say, but how do we actually go about embedding machine knowledge into a human mind? Well, how do we embed human knowledge into a human mind? We teach. So we can put that to, uh, well, let's, let's explain it first. We'll do an audience participation thing. So uh, we're going to play a game called the rectangle game. And somewhere on this board is a hidden rectangle. And it's my job to teach you where that rectangle is. So let's say it's here. And I'm going to teach you by giving you examples. If I put an ex example down and it's inside the rectangle, the computer is going to label it as a circle. If I give you an example that's outside the rectangle, the computer is going to label it as an X. That's a negative example. So let's say I give you these two examples and the computer labels them. Where's the rectangle? It's 
is B. <laughs> because if it was a bigger rectangle, I would have put the points further out because I'm trying to teach you where the rectangle is. And it can't be smaller because that's inconsistent with the data. So if you were a computer, you'd actually need four or more examples to constrain that. But I was able to teach you one of infinitely many rectangles by giving you two data points. Because you know how teachers act. You know what my intention is. You have all that social context there. So we can put this to math. We have two equations. You don't need to know what they mean. I will explain it. So the top one says that teachers choose examples that tend to increase the learner's belief in the correct hypothesis. So I'm taking a specific learner with specific beliefs into consideration, and I am trying to choose data to move them to a specific hypothesis. Learners, on the other side, they understand this. They're aware of how teachers act. So they update accordingly while also taking into, into account their prior or current beliefs. So can we do this for things that are more interesting than rectangles? Sure, we can uh, approximate this recursive uh, set of equations to do teaching image categories. And so uh, our colleague, April Schweinhardt, put a head camera on, walked around in a park and around campus and got all of these images. Uh, she did some processing on them. That's why they look, I guess, low quality, but it's a uh, techniques from the perception literature to kind of make them perceptually similar in certain dimensions. And so we separated these images into indoor images and outdoor images. And we did some feature extraction using some techniques from the perception literature to pull out perceptually uh, salient features of these images. And we learned a two category model for each of these image types. So we have on the top, a uh, two category model for the indoor images. So the ca in one category is close to the origin here and the other one is farther away. And then we have the two category for the outdoor environment. You can see that the categories here are a lot farther apart. Then we're gonna teach these categories by either uh, central images or mean images. These are images that come from the center of those categories. You would consider them maybe the maximum likelihood images or the most prototypical images of those categories, or we use that teaching model to s select the set of images which has the highest likelihood of producing the true belief in the, uh, in the learner. Then we're gonna evaluate our performance at teaching by having participants label ambiguous data. And the ambiguous data are the images that sit between the two categories. So they're the ones that kind of overlap here in the middle and that are gonna be the most difficult to distinguish. And these are the results. So what we found was that for the outdoor images, there wasn't really much of a difference between the two uh, teaching methods. The clusters here you can see are very far apart. And when you look at the images, uh, you can see they're sort of split into planes and wooded images. But for the indoor images, where the clusters are much closer together, uh, folks who got the mean or the prototypical images, they performed at chance but people who got the teaching data, they perform better than chance and they perform statistically better than the people who got the mean data. So we did have some success in transferring some machine knowledge, which was fairly arbitrary to a human being. But you can't just transfer any old knowledge. It has to be compatible with a human being. So we repeated the same experiment. Uh, that's what this GMM thing is. We use Gaussian mixture models as our uh, knowledge representation here. Uh, we also tried representing the knowledge a bit differently using techniques from uh, image processing rather, or image processing and uh, classification rather than perception. So we kind of broke the image apart. We created this visual vocabulary, which we put into a bag of words model and uh, tried to teach that using the same methods. And it just didn't work. It looks like it worked, so teach is a little bit higher, but that's not statistically significant. So this sort of teaching helps people to recover machine knowledge, but only if that knowledge is compatible with the human that you're teaching to. Uh, problems with this is that it's uh, recursive math and teaching is harder than learning. So when you're teaching, you have to consider what the learning, learner is going to learn from your teaching. And also learning from teachers is harder than teaching. And 
teaching to learners, learning from teachers is harder than learning from teachers. <laughs> and we really don't like recursion when we're doing machine learning, uh, especially when we're, do, we're having to compute integrals of integrals of integrals of integrals. So there's a lot of work here uh, to make this scalable. And uh, that's exciting work, if not slow, but we're getting there. So uh, to wrap up, AI has some problems that make it unsafe sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't really matter. For a lot of things, it doesn't really matter. But when it matters, it really matters. And explainable AI can help us get there. It can help us make, to AI, uh, it can help us make AI safer. The spirit of explainable AI encompasses more than explanation. It's about making these machines completely transparent and intuitive, not just to the researchers, but to the end user, the stakeholder, the person who's going to jail if the decision doesn't pan out, really. Uh, to do that, we need to think of the human user, because humans learn a lot differently than machines, especially when uh, you can get them to anthropomorphize the system that they're interacting with. To do that, uh, we need to focus more on interpretable models that are trivially explainable, that are compatible with the human users, uh, rather than adding extra models onto our uh, uninterpretable models. We saw that teaching is effective for certain types of models, but we need those models to be compatible with human beings. And a lot of this is why DARPA is looking for new machine learning processes to, uh, to interface with human beings. And there's still a long way to go. But what's good is that we're having these conversations. People are thinking about it. DARPA alone has dedicated basically $2 billion to programs that are fixing the existing problems with AI, making them more human, making them interact better with humans. And for us, that gives us a lot of really cool problems to solve. There's paradigm shifts coming. And uh, I'm really excited to be a part of that. And so uh, thank you, and I'm happy to take questions. I saw a hand in the very, very back there. Uh, I'm not quite sure that I follow. So, so um, the, the goal is to make things more explainable and more interpretable, right? But, um, but also for it to um, for it to be transparent to the end user. And I'm wondering if uh, if there's any sort of concern about a trade-off between being explainable to the end user, but then not actually um, solving the problem, versus versus just continuing to offer mixed uses, as you said. Yeah. Um, that's, I mean, that's going to require some thought. I haven't thought about it that way. Uh, yeah, there, she was uh, wondering about the trade-off between explanation and anthropomorphization. I'm still, I'm sorry, I'm still not sure I understand. Uh, come to me after and we'll, we'll, right. Yeah, there, yeah. So the question is, how do we deal with explainable AI if it's performing worse than non-explainable AI? Uh, so there have been ways of adding uncertainty to, I guess, deep learning and stuff like that. Quantifying uncertainty is one way, but if your uncertainty doesn't mean anything, uh, that's kind of a hard thing. I, I really don't know how to answer that question other than some cases it might pay to just admit that you don't know and not do anything, then pretend that you don't. So if you are 99% accurate in a non-explainable model, but the other uh, you know, 1% of the time you do something really tragic, that's bad. <laughs> so I think, I mean, it's definitely a case-by-case -case basis, and you just need to decide um, what the risks are of failure. So be careful with the models that you use. 
uh, in the green shirt there. Yep, you, yep. So Uh, I think it's going to be domain specific to a degree. I think uh, putting things out that are kind of removed from human language might help things like that. So giving, I guess, images rather than words. Uh, so if you give a figure of a probability distribution or something like that, that might help. But what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to pair very closely with uh, psychologists and social science researchers and actually run the experiments because I can't answer that question without running an experiment, and that's really important to do. Here. Um, you just mentioned that, that fragility is quantifiable. In, is, that, is that what you said earlier in the response to the question? Uh, uncertainty is unquantifiable. Yep. Uh, I think what we, we can't make it, I don't think we can necessarily make it less fragile. I mean, it, making domain specific models is one way and I think probabilistic programming is a really good approach to that because you get uncertainty as a part of that. You can design a model based on your understanding of a specific domain. So you're not just saying, here's the input, here's the output, it's make something. You can kind of model the mechanics of that domain and if it's probabilistic, you get uncertainty at every step and you can propagate your error through and things like that. So I think it's more about becoming aware of the uncertainty, embracing it, and knowing what to do with uncertainty uh, that's going to help there. Right there. Uh, yep, yeah, so he was asking about other methods to achieve safe AI apart from explainability. And I think a really simple one is responsibility. So who is on the line when the decision fails? And I think that's a big ethical question that we have yet to work out. We've yet to work it out with uh, self-driving cars. The decision was that we're, the safety driver is the one responsible. Maybe it should be us. Maybe we should be responsible. Maybe if what we built uh, goes into production and kills somebody, maybe we should go to jail because we're the, per the people that have the best understanding of those failure modes. So I think there are some ethical considerations. And I think if we're all scared to death of screwing up, then I think AI is going to look a lot different. That might be harsh, but that's, that's one way. No AI for anyone. Uh, I think, I'm, I'm certain that there is, but I don't know it off the top of my head. I know there is a upcoming uh, DARPA program called Sailon, and uh, it's about kind of baking in human capabilities like transfer learning and things like that. So if you're interacting with worlds where the rules are changing or you want to analogize to uh, different worlds or things like that, things that people can really easily do, like. I can learn Go on a 9x9, nine nine, and I can also kind of play on a, on a standard size board, uh, but machines have to be retrained. So I think introspection is going to come into play there uh, when you have to really realize the limits of what you know and what you can do with it. 
uh, but I'm sorry, off the top of my head, I don't, I can't give you any citations. Uh, right there. The problem is you can get uncertainty from a convolutional neural network, but it doesn't really make sense. So you can, uh, Yarn Gall has a really cool blog post. Uh, it's got a lot of like animations and graphics, and he was talking about explaining uncertainty, and I'm over time, uh, by the way, but uh, it was talking about classifying, like making a fruit classifier and then giving it a frog. What does it say? It's uh, you want to have high uncertainty in that situation. And uh, someone did that and with his code, and, it, and he said, it said with high certainty it was a frog, or it was a green apple or something like that. The frog was with high certainty a green apple. So it doesn't really make any sense. We need to have in systems that their uncertainty kind of maps to what's actually going on in the world. Oh, thank you.